Alright, so this is part three. Part three of practicing the presence of God. Let's go ahead and get started. I think we left off in the letters last time, so let's look. Uh, this is his fifth letter. And he wrote this to a woman who was about to dedicate her entire life and her future, her, her everything, uh, to Jesus. Um, uh, she would make a promise never to get married, and um, she would she would become a nun, is what it is. Anyway, this is what he wrote her. I received two... Oh, I'm sorry, this isn't a letter to her, it's, a, it's about her. I received today two books and a letter from Sister, who is preparing to make her profession. She has asked for the prayers of your holy community, and yours in particular, as she prepares for this important step. I can see that she is counting on these prayers, so please don't disappoint her. Ask God that she may make her sacrifice purely out of love for him with a firm resolve to be entirely devoted to him. I will send you one of the books, which is about the presence of God, a topic that, in my opinion, encompasses the entire spiritual life. It seems to me that anyone who practices this presence of God faithfully will quickly become spiritual. I know that in order to practice this presence of God correctly, the heart must be emptied of everything else, because God wants to possess the heart alone. And just as he cannot fully possess the heart unless it is emptied of all other things, he cannot work in it or do what he wills unless it is left vacant for him. There is no way of life in the world more sweet and delightful than that of continually conversing with God. Only those who practice and experience it can truly understand this, but I do not advise you to seek it just for the pleasure it brings. We should practice it out of love and because God desires it of us. If I were a preacher, I would focus on teaching the practice of the presence of God above all else. And if I were a spiritual director, I would advise everyone to do it, because I believe it is so necessary and so easy. Ah, if only we knew how much we need God's grace and assistance, we would never lose sight of him, not even for a moment. Believe me, make a firm and holy resolution now to never willingly forget him, and to spend the rest of your days in his sacred presence deprived of all consolations if he wills it for love of him. Start this work with all your heart, and if you do it as you should, be assured that you will soon see its effects. I will support you with my prayers, poor as they are. Please pray for me and for your holy community. Uh, the next letter is... Uh, to a member of his order who had received a book from him. Let's look at it. I have received the things you sent me through Mrs. So-and-so. It doesn't say what her name is. I'm surprised you haven't shared your thoughts on the little book I sent you, which you must have received by now. Please make a sincere effort to practice what it teaches, even in your old age. It's better late than never. I can't imagine how religious people can live satisfied without practicing the presence of God. As for me, I, I keep myself as much as possible in retreat with him in the depths of my soul. And while I am with him, I fear nothing. But the slightest turning away from him is unbearable. This practice doesn't tire the body much, but it is important to sometimes even often, deny ourselves small pleasures that are innocent 
and lawful. God won't allow a soul that desires to be entirely devoted to him to take pleasure in anything other than him. This is only reasonable. I'm not saying we should put ourselves under any harsh constraints. No, we must serve God with a holy freedom, doing our duties faithfully, without anxiety or stress. We should gently and calmly bring our minds back to God whenever we notice they have wandered from him. It's important to place all our trust in God, setting aside other worries and even some specific forms of devotion, though they may be very good in themselves. These devotions are only means to an end. Once we have reached the end through practicing the presence of God, there's no need to return to the means. Instead, we can continue our relationship with God in his holy presence, whether by an act of praise, adoration, desire, resignation, or thanksgiving, or in any way our spirits can imagine. Don't be discouraged by any resistance you might feel from your nature. You may think at first that it's a waste of time, but you must keep going and resolve to persevere in it until death, no matter what difficulties arise. Please, Remember me in your prayers and know that I am yours in our Lord. Seventh letter. Uh, this one is directed toward the person who's who would compile all of these letters together. I feel great sympathy for you. It would be very beneficial if you could leave the care of your affairs to someone else and Spend the remainder of your life solely in worshiping God. He doesn't require much from us, just a little remembrance of him from time to time, a little adoration, sometimes asking for his grace, hmm? sometimes offering him your sufferings, and sometimes thanking him for the favors he has given you and continues to give you in the midst of your troubles. Comfort yourself with him as often as you can. Lift up your heart to him, even during meals or when you're, in a, when you're in company. Even the smallest resemblance, sorry, even the smallest remembrance will be pleasing to him. You don't need to cry out loudly. He is closer to us than we realize. You don't need to be in church to be with God. You can make, your, you can make an oratory in your heart where you can retreat from time to time to converse with him in meekness, humility, and love. Everyone is capable of such familiar conversation with God, some more, some less. He knows what we can do. So, let's begin. Perhaps he is waiting for just one generous resolution from us. Take courage. We have but little time left to live. You are nearly 64 and <laughs> I am almost 80. Let's live and die with God. Sufferings will be sweet and pleasant to us while we are with him. And the greatest pleasures will be a cruel punishment without him. May he be, <clears throat> May he be blessed for all. Amen. Gradually get used to worshiping him, asking for his grace, and offering him your heart from time to time, even in the midst of your business, as often as you can. Don't always confine yourself strictly to certain rules or specific forms of devotion, but act with a general trust in God, with love and humility. You can assure, hmm, Again, the name is not written. Of my prayers, as humble as they are, and know that I am yours in particular. Here is his eighth letter. This is just a, a letter of advice. You tell me nothing new. You're not the only one troubled by wandering thoughts. Our minds are naturally restless, 
but since the will is in charge of all our faculties, it must bring them back to God, their ultimate end. When our minds, due to a lack of initial focus, develop bad habits of wandering during prayer, it can be difficult to overcome these habits. They often pull us, even against our will, toward earthly things. I believe one remedy is to confess our faults and humble ourselves before God. I don't, in, I don't advise using too many words in prayer. Long discourses often lead to mere, sorry, long discourses often lead to more distractions. Instead, hold yourself in prayer before God like a silent or paralyzed beggar at a rich man's gate. Make it your main focus to keep your mind in the presence of the Lord. If your mind sometimes wanders and withdraws from him, don't worry too much about it. Anxiety and trouble are, well, they only serve to distract the mind further rather than bring it back to focus. Mm. The will should gently and calmly return the mind to God. If you persevere in this way, God will have pity on you. One way to easily recollect the mind, to recollect, huh, one way to re, one way to easily recollect the mind during prayer and keep it calm, is not to let it wander too much at other times. If you keep your mind often in the presence of God, it will be easier to maintain tranquility during prayer and to bring it back from distractions. I've already explained at length in my previous letters the benefits we can gain from practicing the presence of God. Let's take this seriously and pray for each other. Yes, and so in the next letter, his ninth letter, um, well, I'll let it speak for itself. The enclosed letter is my response to the one I received from M. Please deliver it to her. She seems full of good intentions, but she wants to progress faster than grace allows. We don't, we don't become holy all at once. I recommend her to your care. We should help each other with advice and even more so by setting good examples. Please keep me updated on her progress, whether she remains fervent and obedient. Let us often remind ourselves that our only purpose in this life is to please God, and that perhaps everything else is just foolishness and vanity. You and I have lived over 40 years in religious life. Have we spent those years loving and serving God, who in his mercy has called us to this life for that very purpose? I am filled with shame and confusion when I, ref when I reflect on the great favors God has done for me and continues to do without ceasing, on the one hand, and on the other, on how poorly I have used them and how little I have advanced in the path of perfection. Since, by his mercy, God still gives us a little time, let us begin in earnest. Let us make up for lost time and return with full confidence to the Father of mercies, who is always ready to receive us with love. Let us renounce, generously renounce, for love of him, everything that is not him. He deserves infinitely more. Let us think of him constantly. Let us put all our trust in him. I have no doubt that we will soon experience the effects of this, receiving an abundance of his grace through which we can do all things, while without it we can do nothing but sin. We cannot escape the dangers of life without God's, without God's confidence constant and active help. 
Let us, therefore, pray to him continually. How can we pray to him without being with him? How can we be with him without thinking of him often? And how can we often think of him without forming a holy habit of doing so? You may say that I always repeat the same thing. It's true because this is the best and easiest method I know, and since I use no other, I advise everyone to adopt it. We must know God before we can love him. To know God, we must think of him often. And when we come to love him, we will think of him often as well, for our hearts will be with our treasure. This is an argument well worth considering. Okay, so the next is his 10th letter. In case you're wondering, we are approaching the end. It's actually not a very long book, not a very long devotional at all. So here we are, the 10th letter. I struggled quite a bit to bring myself to write to him, mm, and, and I'm doing it now purely because you and Madam asked me to. Please write the directions and send it to him. I'm very pleased with the trust you have in God. I hope that he will continue to increase it in you. We can never have too much trust in such a good and faithful friend, who will never fail us in this world or in the next. If M, M makes the best of the loss he has suffered and places all his trust in God, God will soon provide him with another friend, one who is more powerful and more willing to help him. God disposes of hearts as he pleases. Perhaps M, M was too attached to the friend he lost. We should love our friends, but not at the expense of our love for God, which must always come first. Remember what I've recommended to you. Think of God often, during the day, at night, in your work, and even in your leisure. Leisure, sorry, leisure. He is always near you and with you. Don't leave him alone. You would think it rude to leave a friend alone who came to visit you. So why must God be neglected? Don't forget him. Think of him often. Adore him continually and live and die with him. This is the glorious work of a Christian. In a word, this is our calling. If we don't know it, we must learn it. I will try to help you with my prayers, and I am yours in our Lord. All right, the next one in his, uh, this is his 11th letter. He's writing it to uh, someone who is very sick and who has apparently been praying and, and being prayed for, uh, for recovery, but no miraculous recovery has taken place yet. And this is his advice to him. And again, he is a monk who has devoted himself to a In, to an intentionally challenging life of servitude to God. So some of what he says uh, might take you aback a bit. But he is a very old man, and he himself has been sick and lame. So it's not as though he's talking as somebody who has never been sick. Anyway, this is what he writes. I'm not praying for you to be delivered from your pain. 
but I am praying earnestly that God would give you the strength and patience to bear it for as long as he wills. Comfort yourself in him who holds you fastened to the cross. He will release you when he thinks it's best. Happy are those who suffer with him. Get used to suffering in this way and seek from him the strength to endure as much and as long as he sees necessary for you. People of the world don't understand these truths, and it's no wonder. They suffer as the world does, not as Christians. They see sickness as a natural pain, not as a gift from God. Seeing it only in this light, they find nothing but grief and distress in it. But those who see sickness as coming from God's hand, as a sign of his mercy and as a means he uses for their salvation, often find great sweetness and even consolation in it. I wish you could be convinced that God is often, in some sense, closer to us and more present with us in sickness than in health. Don't rely on any other physician because, in my view, he has reserved your cure for himself. Put all your trust in him, and you will soon see the effects of it in your recovery, which we often delay by trusting more in medicine than in God. I want to in interject here and just remind you that this is being written in medieval Europe. Uh, to be specific, medieval France, I believe. So the medicine at the time their well-intentioned, was not very good. So, just keep that in mind. Anyway, he says, uh, put all your trust in him, and you will soon see the effects of it in your recovery, which we often delay by trusting more in medicine than in God. Whatever remedies you use, they will only work as far as he permits. When pain comes from God, only he can heal it. He often sends diseases of the body to cure those of the soul. Comfort yourself with the knowledge that he is the sovereign physician of both soul and body. I can imagine you might say that it's easy for me to speak this way, that. I eat and drink at the table of the Lord. You're right. But consider this. Wouldn't it be a great torment for the worst criminal in the world to eat at the king's table, be served by him, and yet have no assurance of pardon? I believe such a person would feel immense unease, which could only be eased by trusting in the king's goodness. Likewise, whatever pleasures I experience, I experience at the table of my king, my sins always before my eyes, and the uncertainty of my pardon torment me. Though I find a certain sweetness even in that torment. Be content with the condition God has placed you in, no matter how happy you think I am. I envy you. Pain and suffering would be a paradise for me if I could suffer with my God. And the greatest pleasures would be hell if I could enjoy them without him. My only consolation is to suffer something for his sake. Soon, I will go to God what comforts me in this life is that I now see him by faith in such a way that I sometimes feel I, I don't just believe, I, I see. I feel what faith teaches us and in that assurance and practice of faith, I will live and die with him. 
Stay with God. Always. It's the only support and comfort in your afflictions. I will pray that he stays with you. I offer my service to you. So, then, in his next letter, um, he writes another letter to this sick person. Apparently they had written back. So there's a conversation going on here. And he says, If we were well accustomed to practicing the presence of God, all physical diseases would be much easier to bear. God often allows us to suffer a little, to purify our souls, and to keep us close to him. Take courage and offer him your pain continually. Pray for the strength to endure it. Above all, develop the habit of keeping yourself in conversation with God as much as possible and forget him as little as possible. Adore him in your infirmities. Offer yourself to him from time to time and in the midst of your suffering. Humbly and lovingly ask him to make you conform to his holy will. I will try to support you with my poor prayers. God has many ways of drawing us to himself. Sometimes he hides himself from us, but faith alone, which will not fail us in times of need, should be our support and the foundation of our confidence, which must be entirely in God. I don't know how God will deal with me, but I am always happy. The whole world suffers and I, who deserve the harshest discipline, experience such continual and great joy that I can hardly contain it. I would willingly ask God for a share of your sufferings, but I know my weakness is so great that if he left me alone for even a moment, I would be the most wretched person alive. Yet, I also know that he cannot leave me alone, because faith gives me as strong a conviction as any physical sense that he never forsakes us until we have first forsaken him. Let us fear leaving him. Let us stay with him always. Let us live and die in his presence. Please pray for me as I pray for you. In his 13th letter, this conversation continues, and he writes, I'm pained to see you suffer so long. Uh, what gives me some comfort and softens the sorrow I feel for your troubles is that they are signs of God's love for you. See them in this light, and you will bear them more easily. In your situation, I think you should stop using human remedies and completely surrender yourself to God's providence. Perhaps he is waiting for that surrender and perfect trust in him to heal you. Since despite all your efforts, medicine has been unsuccessful and your condition has worsened. It's not tempting God to place yourself in his hands and expect everything from him. As I mentioned in my last letter, God sometimes allows physical illness to cure the sickness of the soul. So take courage and make a virtue of necessity. Ask God not for relief from your pain, but for the strength to bear it resolutely out of love for him, for as long as he wills. Such prayers may be difficult for our natural inclinations, 
but they are most pleasing to God and sweet to the, and sweet to those who love him. Love makes suffering bearable. And when we love God, we suffer for his sake with joy and courage. I urge you to do this. Find comfort in him, the only true physician of all, of all our ailments. He is the father of the afflicted, always ready to help us. He loves us infinitely more than we can imagine. So love him and seek consolation nowhere else. I hope you will soon find it. Farewell. I will support you with my prayers, as humble as they are, and I will always be yours in our Lord. In the 14th letter, the next letter, the conversation still continues. I thank our Lord for having given you some relief as you desired. I have often been near death, yet I was never more satisfied than in those moments. Accordingly, I didn't pray for relief, but rather for strength to suffer with courage, humility, and love. <sighs> How sweet it is to suffer with God. No matter how great the suffering, accept it with love. It is paradise to suffer and be with him. So if we want to enjoy the peace of paradise in this life, we must get used to a familiar, humble, and affectionate conversation with him. We must prevent our spirits from wandering away from him for any reason. We must make our hearts a spiritual temple where we continually adore him. We must always watch over ourselves to avoid doing, saying, or thinking anything that might displease him. When our minds are so occupied with God, suffering becomes full of grace and consolation. I know that reaching this state is difficult at first because we must act purely out of faith. But although it's difficult, we also know that with God's grace, which he never refuses to those who earnestly ask for it, we can do all things. Knock and keep knocking, and I guarantee that he will open to you in his own time and give you all at once what he may have withheld for many years. Farewell. Pray to him for me as I pray for you. I hope to see him soon. What follows is his final letter and this marks the end of the book. This is his 15th letter. And it goes, God knows best what we need, and everything he does is for our good. If we truly understood how much he loves us, we would always be ready to accept everything from his hand with equal indifference whether sweet or bitter. Everything would please us if it came from him. The most painful afflictions never seem unbearable, except when we see them in the wrong light. But when we see them as coming from the hand of God, who gives them when we understand that, is, that it is our loving Father who humbles and distresses us, our sufferings will lose their bitterness 
and even become a source of comfort. Let our main focus be to know God. The more we know Him, the more we will want to know Him. Since our knowledge of Him usually determines the measure of our love, the deeper and broader our knowledge becomes, the greater our love will be. If our love for God were great, we would love Him equally in pain and pleasure. Let us not get caught up in seeking or loving God for any special favors He has done or may do for us. No matter how elevated those favors may be, such favors, no matter how great, cannot bring us as close to God as one simple act of faith can. Let us seek Him often by faith. He is within us. We don't need to look elsewhere. Isn't it rude and worthy of blame if we leave Him alone to busy ourselves with trivial matters that neither please Him nor perhaps even offend Him? It's to be feared that these trifles will one day cost us dearly. Let's begin to be sincerely devoted to him. Let's cast everything else out of our hearts. He wants to possess them entirely. Ask him for this favor. If we do our part, we will soon see the change in us that we desire. I can't thank him enough for the relief he has given you. I hope by his mercy to see him within a few days. Let's pray for one another. And the compiler of this book ends the book by saying, he took to his bed two days later and died within the week. That is the end of practicing the presence of God by Brother Lawrence. Again, it's only a devotional. It is not spirit. It is not uh, divinely authoritative like the Bible. It's not. And he is a Roman Catholic monk who, unbeknownst to him, <laughs> is often uh, more in sync with Protestant thought than Roman Catholic thought. And for that reason, among Protestants, um, this book of his uh, containing his letters and, and interviews with him it is cherished. I've read it several times and uh, my best friend in the USA has read it several times as well. I hope that you've benefited from it as well. So I'll end this by saying Pray to him for me as I pray for you. I am always yours in the Lord.